How's it going? Great. How are you? I'm okay. All right. Do you want to play some Prismata alongside this? Absolutely, we can do that. Um, you can wipe the floor with me. <laughs> that may happen. Um, uh, I, I have yet to really do well in ranked, so... It, it's probably going to happen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I'm a bit flustered right now because we just uh, we just had a Prismata thread hit the Reddit front page. No way, really? Yeah, if you check Reddit right I'm now... Let's nice check it. It's it's just it's our loading screen. Somebody posted our loading screen. Oh, what subreddit? Uh, r slash gifs. No way. That's fantastic. But if you just go to the regular front page, we're like number four. Yeah, there it is. Oh wow. And it is and, really mesmerizing. And so whenever whenever something like this happens, I always try and jump in and do whatever we can. So oh, I absolutely. actually I posted the source code to the animation on Reddit. <laughs> And somebody gave me gold for it. Oh yeah, it's <laughs> kind of, <laughs> kind of funny. Awesome. How that works, but. Um, well, if you're busy with that, we could do the interview another time. Ah, uh, well, that's okay. I got I got some time now. I could take a break from it. Because <laughs> I know it must be really important to get out there and read it and advertise as much as you can. Yeah, and I mean, I don't really try to spam, but if something like no. this happens, and I try to make the most of it, like the uh, the today I fucked up post, yeah, month that started it all. Yeah, that's the thing. Like Reddit, Reddit is all a it's a game of luck. But Absolutely. when you do get lucky, it's it's about trying to take advantage as much as you can. Yes, I can really understand that from posting uh, videos from my own channel. It's all about what time you get in and just who happens to like it and if it gets shared and upvoted. Yeah, I actually first heard about Prismata from the original uh, Tifu post, and I looked yeah. at it, and I thought that looks interesting. I should look into that, and it actually slipped my mind, and I didn't see it until the more recent best of post. I uh, see. A couple, couple weeks ago, and that was when I asked for a code. I wish I'd done uh. it sooner. I'd be so much better now, because <laughs> I'll be honest, I'm not great. I am not great. What would you oh. say your uh, your score is? Oh, my ranked. like my my ranking on the ladder. Elo, yeah. Um, well, right now it's crappy because I was I was, I I really should make a second account because I often like to play degenerate or rushy strategies just to test yeah. them out, and it's it's not a strategy that's very good for ranking up. I think my highest I ever was is about twenty eighty something like that, almost twenty one hundred. But now I'm sitting at like eighteen fifty or something. Oh, you're at thirteen. Um, yeah, I can see you on the list. Yeah, um, which is kind of miserably bad. Like some days, I've I've tried to play very conservatively and just rank up, and I can you know I can win fifteen in a row. But yeah. um, like uh, I I don't necessarily play to try and top the rankings. I usually play to test things and to figure out if if builds are too strong or get a feeling for what's going on in the game. But I play just about every day. I can understand. That. I feel like I'm doing the same thing now. It's it has absorbed me this game. <laughs> I didn't expect I'd like it so much. I haven't touched Hearthstone in weeks. So well, kudos there. Glad to hear it. <laughs> All right, should we get started? Absolutely. What is your username? My username is Aldrahill, and I'll write that in chat in the, in the Skype chats. There you go. Okay. Oh, I'm really nervous about this match. I still, I mean, I can beat Masterbot seven oh. second, so I think, oh, I'm great, and then I do a single rank match, and it's just, oh, it's hell. Okay, well, I'm ready when you are. Let's do it. All right. Is it okay if I uh, do questions alongside playing? Of course. All right. Well, wait a second. What turn am I? All right, cool. So, first question. Um. I just want to talk about the different game modes. So, uh, what other different kind of game modes are in development besides just the basic practicing of computer and uh, ranked? Um, well, the idea is that eventually um, we want to. I mean, we've always divided our player base up into a couple of different uh, psychographics. We have very competitive players who just want to play to win or rank up, and the the game is mostly appealing to those type of players currently. Um, but in the long run, we also want to appeal to social gamers as well as people who just sort of want to play the game on their own terms and yeah. and uh, enjoy the game for what it is. So we're building a single-player campaign. 
Yeah. Um, if it's well received, then we'll build lots of other single player content. And that, that single player campaign is going to be free because um, we think it's really important, especially for onboarding and, and teaching the game to new players to have a, a good single player experience. So we're building that all out. Um, in addition to that, we've been messing around with raids. Um, yeah. Raids being like a PvE mode, um, sort of a, like you team up with your buddies to try and defeat the boss or defeat the dragon. Um, and we've had raids in Prismata in our sort of dev version for like a year and a half, quite a long time. Um, and a lot of our, our testers or our early players, they found raids to be more compelling than the actual competitive mode. <laughs> so... Um, it may be something that we put a lot more effort into, but again, it's appealing to a completely different class of gamer than uh, the, the sort of competitive uh, prismata. Yeah, I've seen you talk about some of it, I think, in some of your daily uh, vlogs on YouTube. Yeah, well, we're going to give a full like exposition of what raids are and how they work and, and how they're coming along. I'll I just let you know right now, I'm copying a strategy I saw on Reddit. Yeah, I'm just copying a strategy I saw on Reddit, and it's going so poorly for me. Oh. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Well, it's, um, I, I definitely saw a lot of information about raids, and someone um, actually, while speaking to on chat, talked about a mode called Sevens as well. Sevens? I'm not sure if they, if they were just completely making that up. I, I don't have a clue. Then I was, um, and I think we were all being lied to in general chat. Sevens? <laughs> Hey, some people can really bullshit. I, I, I don't know what they could be referring to. Um, like maybe ma the master bot seven seconds. Is that what they meant? I don't think so. But that would be, that would seem logical, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay. So do I want to bust your poly wall? I don't know. It's probably not worth it. Um. Anyways, no. So so the thing about raids is yeah. um. We spent all this time sort of developing it and messing around with it. And, like, we had a number of players come in and test it and try it out. And some of them told us that, like, they, they liked it better than the, the rest of Prismata. And some other players really weren't into it. And, and in order to fully develop raids into what we really want it to be, it, it's, we realized it's going to take a tremendous amount of effort. Because, um, like, well... First of all, we need to do all the graphics and the yeah. stuff like that. But it's also the the balance and the actual game mode. Because when we first started out, it was like, okay, you we, we started with three-player raids. So you and two allies against a boss. The boss is spawning minions in each of your lanes. And the question was, how do we have interaction between you and your allies so it's not just three parallel 1v1s? And uh, we tried a bunch of different models for that interaction, and uh, some of them had the problem of not enough interaction, it just felt like three 1v1s. Others had the problem of every turn felt like a multi-party consensus problem, and the, the level of interaction was so much that it, it actually crippled the rest of the game. Um, and uh, what we ended up settling on is a very limited amount of interaction where you can aggro minions... Uh, from your ally's lane over to your lane to fight them on behalf of your ally and that's sort of your way of helping people because we really wanted people to be able to play raids without necessarily needing to have Skype open or, or uh, some kind of voice chat um, and we built like a we built an emote system into the raids where you can easily tell your allies like oh I need help or oh uh, I can help um, stuff like that so I think it's mostly coming together in a way that's satisfactory, and uh, I don't know. I'm pretty excited. I think once raids come out, it will be something that people really enjoy. It's yeah, just we we also awesome. don't we don't want to spread ourselves too thin as developers, right? Like yeah. we're working on all this other stuff. So raids are, are they're really on the back burner until we get the single player campaign out, which I guess that kind of sucks. But there's there's not really much we can do about it. I'm certainly excited from it from what I've heard about it and what you just told me. I love it sounds like really really I mean I, I gotta be honest, I am just terrified of going into ranked. So I think yeah. the environment would be interesting. Well and a lot of players are like that and especially it provides some sort of end game content. Like we can uh 
we can make a lot of different quests and bosses. Um, we could even have leaderboards for them and have a real like solid yeah. uh, like raid ladder, and and that could be completely awesome. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, about the the game itself, are you working on a standalone client? Um, so the way it's built right now is um, it's written in ActionScript, so we can build it using Adobe Air, we can build it using Flash, and we can build a standalone using Flash Builder. Yeah. Um, right now we're deploying the alpha on the web because it's by far the easiest way to deploy new versions and updates and test things and overall have a a robust user experience yeah. uh, and people always ask is it always going to be web and we say well no um, there's no reason it, it needs to be always web at the same time I always ask people why why do they not want it to be web why do they want a desktop version and oftentimes it's just a case of there's there's some kind of perception that a flash game is a cheap experience <laughs> and uh i think what we're going to see in the next couple of years is browser based games uh become a bit more serious than they used to be and and sort of uh that market for casual flash games has mostly gone to mobile mm -hmm. um and but on the other hand we've seen you know like day 9's working on this artillery project which is a really cool browser based online game and I think we're going to see more stuff like that. Um, so it's entirely possible that something like Prismata could predominantly stay in the browser. Um, now that said, we may we may end up wanting to go on Steam. We may end up wanting to go on mobile. And and these are questions we haven't really made up our mind on. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like like Steam is a big question because um, a lot of games in our genre. You know, in particular, free-to-play multiplayer online games, they don't tend to end up on Steam that much. If you look at the competition, the only ones on Steam are basically Valve's own games. Um, at the same time, it's a wonderful platform, and a lot of users really want us to be on there. So yeah, it's definitely something we think about all the time. And, and we look at other games, too. Like, if you look at Path of Exile, they were not on Steam for, like, forever, and then at some point they decided they were going to be on Steam. Um, I don't know. It could be the same with us that at some point we decide it's worth it. Uh, we'll have to see. Yeah, something is in development. I mean, it's just a quite. I mean, I know, I have no problem with it being on a uh, in browser. I have no. I, I see a lot of people complaining about it sometimes. In discussions well, there are there are some benefits. Let me explain that. Yeah. Um, well, one is like we have replays via links. So if you've ever played a game, you can share replay with your friend just by sharing a link. Um, the fact that people can bookmark it, it actually um, it, it makes it a bit more sticky because people can sort of impulse play when they're browsing the net. It lowers the, the barrier to entry for people to just start playing. Um, there's a lot of web platforms that we can hook into. Like we already have integration with the Twitch API. And of course there are ways to do that without being on web. But there are, are certain things, the fact that you're in a browser and you can have links to things, it, it makes some parts of the experience a lot smoother. Okay, okay. All righty. Thank you. Uh, on to the next question. Uh, I just wanted to talk about the I mean, basic game designer, Prismata. I share this question a lot about the random element of Prismata and what led to you choosing a random decisions rather than a deck building. Right. Um, so, I mean, this is a mechanic used in a lot of yeah. tabletop games. And I think that's, that's where the experience, uh, I mean, that's where the inspiration comes from. Like, okay. we've, we've played a lot of tabletop games, um, or even, like, card games like Dominion or deck-building games of that sort, uh, German board games. But they often have certain random elements in the setup in order to prevent you from memorizing openings so that every game is different. And... Uh, that was essentially the same thing we wanted to do. We wanted to create a game where you had to come up with unique build orders every time, and it has the effect of uh, removing the repetitiveness or the, the memorization aspect of, of memorizing openings. Because if you get to a sufficiently high level at chess, then in order to get better, you have to like do a lot of memory work and a lot of studying. And I think in this day and age, people don't really want that kind of experience. I definitely find there's a lot of studying already in Prismata. I'm having to look at different strategies and try well, to look people, ahead. 
People, <laughs> yeah, but it's it's not the case of like you have to research the Sicilian no, defense and and know all the variations. It's well, something you can toy with, you can play with on your own. It's a lot more independent rather than having yeah. set strategies. And you don't need to come into the game having done outside study on how to play. It's just every time you get a new set of eight units, you can explore those eight units and discover the potential that they offer. And what we found is that this actually leads to a, a, a good portion of the game's addictiveness. Because every time you go to play a new game, you have a new set of units. They have new combos and new interactions. And there's this novelty associated with playing with a new set every time. And that novelty is very addictive. It's very... Um, like it's it's compulsive in the sense that after you finish one game, you really want to play another one because it's like, oh, what what units am I going to get next? And yeah. the whole the whole part of the experience where the randomness comes at the start is very crucial to this this novelty and addictiveness because once you finish one game, it's like, oh, I want I want that random event to happen now, and it's it's exciting. So we get to have the the advantage of having. Uh, exciting random events without the drawbacks of having a, a really RNG heavy game design. So I, I think it works out quite well. How do you, how do you feel about a do-over of this game? A do-over? Uh, <laughs> we could try little... again if you want. Yeah, I think I may have been a couple turns ago, it may have been guaranteed, yeah. Uh, I, I have never struggled actually so hard in a game, and I'm very surprised at this. But it's never. It's, it keeps drawing me back in to work on all these different strategies, different ways to play. Honestly, well, what I can it, just barely beat my girlfriend playing this. Just barely. What it's what it's done for us that's been really great is is a lot of people. Um, they want to watch people stream the game because they you know they play it, they try it once or twice, they do okay, and then they they want to learn more about how to play the game better. And um, I think it was a couple of weeks ago we decided, oh well, let's let's make streaming a thing, mm -hmm. and. So I added this little bar in the side of the game, which has a, a, a link to all of the people streaming Prismata right now on Twitch. And it was just a little like Twitch API thing. It, it took all of a couple of hours to uh, implement. But since we added that, the number of people streaming and the amount of people watching streams yes. has just exploded. Like I was and, looking at uh, uh, Crash Overlord. His, um, Crash Overlord, rather. His uh, viewership has really risen as one of the, the well-known streamers, anyway. Yeah, and and like There's always, people streaming. Yeah, and it was just it was literally just something we decided that oh let's let's put it in for fun let's see what happens and the the difference has been crazy. Like we used to be the only ones who really streamed Prismata, and it was after that very first uh, Reddit post hit the front page. Um, I remember after that happened, it was on a Friday, and I, I there was a party that Friday night, and I I went to all my friends at the party, and I asked them all, like, what should I do now? We just hit the Reddit front page. How do we, like, keep the momentum going? And they all told us two things. One is you got to run a Kickstarter, and two is you got to stream. Yes. Um, so the very next day was my first day ever streaming anything. Um, and, uh, yes, yeah, so that, was, that was the first Prismata stream. And so we kept up a schedule of streaming maybe three or four times a week, and... Eventually, other people started streaming, and we, we didn't have to stream anymore. So it's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's now something that's just taking on a life of its own. And it's really interesting to watch. The, every single day, the viewership on average grows. It's really cool to see so many people, people getting more and more interested into it. Yeah, I'm, I'm blown away by the response. And I, I never could have predicted, like, in, in the last, say, three weeks, the growth has probably been, like... I don't know, a thousand percent or, or some, something like stupid like that. Um, my friend uh, Shalev, he did stats and he found that in the last two weeks, more games have of Prismata have been played than all the other games of Prismata played up until that point combined. <laughs> Damn. Um, and of course, we can't measure all the games that were played before we had the current database. But he said it's you know it's different by enough that those games are probably all insignificant. I mean, it's just it's just a crazy amount of growth. I mean, the Kickstarter is. Uh, I mean, it looks like. I mean, you know, hopefully it looks like it's going to be funded. The way the rate oh, has been growing. I think it'll get funded. the 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 thing that I'm really excited about is so. In, in most Kickstarters like ours, where we don't have a big initial following, the biggest week is the last week. 
right? In, in many Kickstarters, yeah. the biggest week is the first week because they spam all of their mailing list and say, yo, support us on Kickstarter. Uh, I mean, we started out with a mailing list of you know, people who'd, who'd signed up on Reddit but weren't necessarily that engaged. Um, so we didn't have like a giant day one. We didn't raise 100K on day one or anything like that. But I think for us, the last week is going to be really exciting and it just keeps growing and growing. Um, and, you know, there's, there's more and more posts, more and more people talking about us. I, I get people asking me uh, for keys for their friends. I get people yeah. asking me to do giveaways. And uh, it, one thing we were really worried about is that the uh, server wouldn't be able to support everyone because um, I think we were, you know, we had about 40 or 50 users and we had issues with memory in the server and we had issues with um, all kinds of things. And... Uh, my server guys have more or less been working 24-7 to keep the capacity up to fix all of the bugs that come up. We fixed like a major memory issue last week. Um, we fixed a bunch of like problems with disconnect and we really wanted to, to make sure we could continue giving keys to backers without the server breaking. So that's one thing that could have went wrong and didn't. So I'm pretty happy about that. Yeah, your servers are going to be taxed again when, this, when it gets funded because it's going to hit the front page of Reddit again, I imagine. Uh, yeah, well, um, I mean, at the end of the day, we're the gatekeepers that control the keys. We yes. can always tell people you got to wait, but um, we really don't want to have to do that because everybody just wants to play the game. And that's why we made this offline demo. And I, I think it's actually, it's, it's not a very good demo. It's something we put together in a day, but we tried to make an offline version of the game that people could get into and they could just play the game. Uh, and it, it wouldn't be taxing on our servers because it's, it's literally like just a regular old Flash game. Um, so, and since we made that, more people have got a chance to try it, and many of them became Kickstarter backers. Uh, we had, I had a guy who said you know, he played the demo for eight hours or something like that. He, he lost his whole day to that yeah. demo. So it did something. Yeah, and it, everything brings attention to it as well. It stays in the consciousness. Even if you don't get a code, they're going to remember it eventually. Yeah, for it. sure. Yeah. Ah, damn. I feel like I'm in a panic when I'm playing this. I feel like I'm over, uh, overmatched and I'm just... Uh, it's every game I play. Every single, I do the same thing every time I look through it and think, oh, crap, what can I do? What strategies can I play? I think too big. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm doing this game. I, I wanted to go the centrifuge into the Lucina, yeah. and now now I need to transition into something, and I don't really know what to get. There's not, not really anything that good in this set, to no, be I was, honest. I was just rushing Xenos, and I'm not sure if I'm... Uh, I think I might regret it. The thing about Xenos is the first one's a really good defender, but future ones aren't that great. Yeah. Um, the thing is, there's no attackers other than Xeno, Lucina, and Blood Rager, so I don't know. I feel like I'm just going to be spamming Tarsiers all game. <laughs> um, hmm. I don't know. Might as well just econ up. Yeah. All right. Um, sorry, I need to not get too invested in it. I'm just completely drawn into it. Uh, next question. Uh, so I want to talk about your uh, the pet the. Um, system which you're going to draw revenue, the cosmetic system. So Absolutely. What other, what other kinds of things besides uh, emotes are you, are you going to be offering? So, for example, like uh, different skins for right. Ca so we, cars? We posted, we posted some skins on the Kickstarter page and how it works is you go into a menu, there's every unit in the game, and so you don't collect the units. What you do is you collect the skins for each unit. Yeah. And so for each unit in the game you can pick which skin you want it to be. So if you want your steel splitters to be pirates, you can set them to the pirates. Um, and you, if you collect all the pirates, like the drone and the, the steel splitter and the tarsier and whatever other pirates we add, then you can make all your guys pirates if you want and have a full pirate set. I mean, I don't know if there'll be pirates for every single unit in the game, but there will be certain themes that exist in certain set of the units, and, and we, we may have certain bonuses for um, collecting all the, the units of a certain theme or a certain type. And I'm not exactly sure how that's going to work out, but the idea will be that you collect a lot of skins, you collect sets of skins, and there will be ways by paying into the game to increase your magic find or control which types of skins you randomly collect or re-roll for skins or, or somehow increase the rarity of the skins that you earn. Or there's, there's some way of paying into the game that 
makes you get the skins you want rather than random ones. Okay. Um, and with regards to the emotes, like emotes first started as an idea of like like a uh, something we could prototype really easy because there's no art asset requirements. You know, we just need to think of emotes, write them down, and then we can have them in the game. We can have something that the players of the game will be earning and progressing uh, as they go through the game, and that was something we we really wanted to have. Um, but what it ended up turning into is is like now everybody's really excited about emotes and we get all these requests for these different types of emotes and um, that's definitely all going to happen but it's, a it's market just for it. Definitely. Yeah, it's it's turned into this thing of its own and I think like if you play a game like Hearthstone and you see these emotes I think people they sort of use that as a, as a, as a base to think, wow, custom emotes, that could be really cool, and then they get really excited about it. So I think for that reason, people have got really excited about our emotes, even though it just started out as sort of a silly little idea. But I think custom emotes are going to be awesome. We've had all these this brainstorming, like, you know, what if for every emote in the game there was also a comeback emote that... <laughs> that you could get and so if a certain if a certain emote got popular then you could equip the comeback emote to that and, and there would be like a meta for emotes and maybe there could be comebacks to the comebacks and there could be these be long cool. long comeback chains and you know if, if you got a really long comeback chain you could have an achievement and and every single thing I'm talking about is is mostly a joke and mostly stuff that is is you know it's either just experimental mm -hmm. or, or literally just an idea that's written down somewhere but it it definitely has us pretty excited for the possibilities I mean I, mean, I would definitely uh, get pirate skins <laughs> well we've had all kinds of requests I've had people who say you know I want I want kawaii anime drones <laughs> and we can do that we can find somebody who draws that um, you know and there's there's certain things that we can do really cheaply like we could take the entire unit set and just make a gold version of it yeah, you know, five minute Photoshop script, and suddenly we have, uh, you know, a hundred pieces of unlockable content. I spent yeah. too much on early defense, and now I'm getting wrecked. All right, this game is sort of a heavy, heavy macro game. A lot of uh... oh, oh, you this that's that's gonna hurt. It's yeah, gonna hurt. Yeah. Uh, I I'm feel not like coming I back these, from this. They, they always got grand plans. I, I always see these grand plans, and it's just nothing happens with them. I just, I just fall apart. See, like now it's got a spam defense, and yeah, that's that's. Yeah, there's there's not too much you can do from here. I'll just let it play out. I'll let I'll let it happen. I'll die gracefully. Okay. That's not um. Funny. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, whenever you're doing a long swipe through your opponent's workers. Yeah. Uh, I don't like seeing all my drones die that quickly. I guess to the point where you start considering, do I keep my drones as defenders? Uh, span the walls and force hills. Last as long as possible. Last turn 15. Uh, I want to talk about uh, Prismata as an eSport, or its possibilities as an eSport. And do you, do you think they could have potential to move into the eSport world? Absolutely. Um... I mean, we're all big esports fans. We've we've run Hearthstone tournaments. In fact, I uh, I used to play a lot of StarCraft. I played in StarCraft tournaments. Alex was a legend level Hearthstone player. We're big fans of any kind of competitive, highly competitive, elite level uh, gaming. And I think Prismata lends itself nicely to that. Um, I'll I'll give you a complaint about some other esports. In a, in a game like Hearthstone, because there's a lot of randomness, it's very difficult for you to have repeat winners of tournaments over and over again. So in StarCraft, there are all these legendary players like Boxer and and Savior and and guys like this who would just like dominate the scene and completely crush everybody else in tournaments. But in games like Magic the Gathering, say, you don't see that nearly as much because there's so much variance in, in who wins. And what we've noticed in Prismata is if, if, if we have really strong players, and, and I believe we're going to have really strong players, yeah. and we're going to see um, we're going to see a lot of like domination of the scene and we'll, we'll develop legendary players and we'll have cult followings, and I'm really excited for that. I think it has a good shot. Um, Prismata is also a great game for observing. It's a great game for commentary. Um, it, it has the property that you don't need to stream with a delay. 
because there's no hidden information. Like you don't have a hand that you need to keep hidden from your opponent. And that hurts a lot of streamers, right? Because like in Hearthstone, a lot of people stream Arena and they don't want to stream Ladder because they just get sniped and their win rate drops from 70% to 50% um, because they just get sniped uh, or stream cheated every, every time basically. Um, and it's a big deal for streamers. So they either have to sacrifice interacting with their audience or they have to not stream at all. Yeah, I, so think, it, I think it has great potential as well because, I mean, the, the sheer amount of depth that people go into to develop the best strategies and play the best. I mean, look at the ladder and the sheer, the sheer competitiveness of the ladder. People are going to be the best. People are going to fight for the best spot. And it's, I can see it becoming just a huge thing. I'm really <laughs> yeah, I I can't wait. Like, um, right now, I think the best players are sort of like Will is one of our developers. I'm one of the developers. Um, we're I think we're getting close to the point where the best player is no longer a developer. That may happen soon. Um, that would be cool. I, I'm really excited for that to happen, and and it's a higher threshold than for a lot of other games because we've been playing this game for four years. You know, this is this is sort of our hobby in a sense. So um, I am eagerly awaiting people to study this game so hard that they overtake us in skill. And then and then rather than us trying to balance the game, we're going to be appealing to these elite players to tell us all the all the stuff that's really broken that we need to fix. Yeah. Things like in uh, League of Legends bringing in pro players to talk about the current builds and talk yeah. about it's broken and things like that. Yeah. Well, for us, there's less of an issue with balance because if something's overpowered, then both players get access to it. Yeah. The thing that we really fear is if there's some specific combination of units that allow either the first player or the second player yes. to execute an unstoppable rush. And we've had certain scares of that form before, and sometimes people will, re will report something like, yo, this build order seems so strong for player two. And just about every time that happened, we investigated it and found that player one had some kind of defense or some kind of counter, or at the very least could build in a similar way and lead to a very complicated and nuanced middle game where there were a lot of choices and a lot of options and it wasn't obvious that any player had a forced win. So we haven't had any huge fires to put out, at least not for a while. Maybe we did back in the day. But, Isn't that what uh, happened to uh, Shadow Fang, I think? Well, so what it was a shadow fang is you can you can see the YouTube video because yes, we, we tried to make this point very clear. It's a yeah. very nuanced point. The point is the shadow fang rush isn't an insta win. It it can be countered, and we actually showed in this YouTube video how to counter all these degenerate shadow fang rushes. <laughs> the problem, well, it was sort of twofold problem. One is that in the presence of some other units like husk in particular, it seemed like maybe it wasn't counterable, or at the very least, it was sufficiently complicated that we couldn't disprove that one player had an auto win. Um, but also just in the in the sense that uh, beginners were doing this and beginners had started to learn about this rush and were executing it um, it's a much easier rush to execute than it is to defend so it it might be the case that if a beginner level player is playing another equally skilled beginner level player then it very much is like an auto win if uh, the players are aware of this rush and so it's it's not necessarily always about optimizing the balance for elite level players, but it's it's also about making the experience at the beginner level good too. And this is something we struggled with in other areas too, um, like certain units that are very easy for beginners to use optimally. We often accidentally or or unintentionally balance them to be too strong. Um, like I can give an example. A unit yeah. like Scorchilla, for example, is actually very hard to use correctly because you have all these decisions about do you leave it back, do you attack with it now, do you block with it. Um, and those are very high skill decisions that make a difference in how well you use the unit. And so um, the difference between how well a high skill player versus a low skill player performs with that unit is astronomical. Um, whereas if you take a unit like... Um, Tatsu Nullifier or Apollo, often what you do is you just like, you know, you snipe the most valuable thing to kill or you freeze the, the biggest wall. And that's sort of a very basic heuristic and beginners essentially use the unit entirely 100% optimally. So there's almost no difference in how effectively a beginner uses the unit versus an expert uses the unit. Mm -hmm. And so if we balance it such that both Scorchilla and Tatsu Nullifier are roughly the same strength in the hands of an expert, 
then Scorchilla is going to be a lot weaker in the hands of a beginner, but Tatsu Nullifier isn't. So then people are going to complain Tatsu is OP. Yeah. Um, so, but it, it's really difficult because we don't want Tatsu to be weak in the hands of experts, which is what it would be if we rebalanced it so that it was more balanced in the hands of beginners. Um, and so it's a very difficult game to play, and there's not always enough parameters to make everybody happy at the end of the day. Um, but fortunately for us, if something's a bit strong or a bit weak, it doesn't really hurt the gameplay that much. It just means that, you know, of the percentage of the times that this unit is present in your set, you might buy it a little bit more or a little bit less than average, but it, it's not going to break the game in any fundamental way. Let's see the similar thing in uh, League of Legends, for example. I play a lot of League, so... <laughs> yeah. But, um, like, with... Especially when you have these large discrepancies between the top level of skill players and the bottom level and new players, when you, like you said, when you overbuff something or under, or nerf it for the early players and the late game people play, pick it up, certain champions are way better in the hands of skilled players. I guess the same could be applied here. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And I think in League they have a lot more parameters to play around with. Like, in League... I think they can make a unit, uh, they can make a champion better in the hands of an unskilled player without making it that much better in the hands of a skilled player. I think that's, they have ways of doing it. That's the dream. That's the dream, yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> about whether or not there's true balance. Uh, for my final question, you've played a couple games with me now. What tips can you give me to make me not as terrible? <laughs> um, what tips? Well, I can give yeah, you general, general tips, yeah, like. General like tips. Um, I don't know, watch lots of streams and practice a lot. Um, specific <laughs> tips. Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a StarCraft player, so I, I always tell StarCraft people, it's like playing Zerg. You want to use all your larvae to make drones and then switch them all to making attackers. And so similarly in Prismata, you want to econ up and then at some point switch off of econ to making attackers. And, and why, why is that the case? The reason is because fundamentally attackers are more efficient than drones. Um, if you if you buy Tarsiers, the amount of Tarsiers you need to buy to kill one wall a turn costs way less than the amount of drones you need to build one wall a turn. The problem is that because walls do a bit of absorbing in their defense, you don't want to immediately rush to attackers because uh, your opponent can just sort of build up a wall. They have a little bit of home base advantage, which cancels out the early part of your attack. And if they have a bigger economy, then they can get a bigger set of attackers and dominate you later in the game. So it's the case of you definitely want to get attack eventually, but where is this transition point? And the thing that determines where the transition point is, is how big are the walls? Um, how strong are the defenders? How big is your home base advantage when you have a big absorbing wall dealing with your opponent's attack? And in particular, whether or not there's a way to get up attack really quickly. Because if there isn't, you can probably econ pretty safely and just, mm -hmm. you know, start getting attackers a little bit later than your opponent. So I think one thing you can do is you can look at unit sets and you can try and plan out the trajectory of the game. You can sort of see, like, is this going to be a high econ game? Are there a lot of fast attackers? Are there a lot of slow attackers? And what is the ultimate set of tech buildings that you want to get? What is the order in which you want to get those tech buildings so that maybe you can get out an early wall or you can get out an early attacker to put a little pressure on your opponent? And you sort of can think globally about the game strategy and what the main trajectory of the game is and what the main sort of options are and, and how you're going to respond to what your opponent chooses to get. I think uh, that type of thinking is yeah. something that can enable you to make good decisions because a lot of people just play the game one turn at a time they sort of think oh what do i want to buy now There's what can i afford to, to buy that, now yeah. um and you know they'll they'll go animus when the only animus units are like shadowfang and tarsier which completely die to the other units like maybe there's a cryo ray and a and a grenade mech or something like that and they're just going to get breached and lose really easily um so yeah you, you have to sort of think about what counters what and then you have to think about what is going to be the trajectory, the trajectory of the game, and how do you optimally travel along that trajectory? Yeah, I mean, I think the first game I played, I, I uh, did a little Drake rush strat, but the only reason I, I did, I spent so little on econ in the beginning, I just kind of rushed the Drake, was because uh, it was I saw it on Reddit. I'll be honest. <laughs> I'm no, sure it's, it played out it's exactly a good build. The thing is, you need you need a follow up to it because yeah, if I, you I, just I, I lack the follow up. I, it's because that's what happens when you copy a specific strategy. You get the specific strategy, but then you lack all the information around it, the follow-up, 
and I had no, I didn't know exactly what to build afterwards, and I kind of floundered. I, I actually think Prismata has this, like, I think the fact that there are some known openings in Prismata, I think of it as a good thing. Yes. Because you can learn just enough that having a bit of knowledge gives you a little bit of an advantage. But it's not the case that you need to memorize deep lines. And, you know, maybe, maybe sometime in the future there will be deep lines to memorize. But I always feel like, given that there are random units in the game and they change every time, that... The specific set of units, you have to tune your build to what units are present. And I don't think there's ever going to be, you know, really deep opening lines in Prismata. I think there will be efficient openings to accomplish a specific goal given the availability of one to two units. But I think beyond that, um, there'll be a lot more like reactive play. Like something you could see in Prismata is you could see you can see builds where people like they just skip a drone one turn and then buy it a turn later and the reason they do that is because they want to have a certain option available to them if their opponent does something else and there's all this like jockeying for position and all this dynamism in the opening where um, like there's two conflicting things one is you want to get out attackers before your opponent to have a bit of a tempo initiative but two is you want to wait to see what your opponent does first so that you can buy the the tech that is sort of the counter to that and you want to be the responder rather than the initiator so um, there's all this conflict between wanting to be proactive and reactive and it creates a, a great amount of interesting opening strategy there's just so much to take in in regards to opening strategies and I feel like I feel like I've been playing this game for four years and I still suck at it like <laughs> I I learn new stuff every time I play a game and I I will often go to games that I lost and I will see mistakes. I will see fundamental strategic errors That's that I the made. Key to getting better. Yeah. I mean, we built replays into the game because yeah. we're like we're ridiculously competitive and obsessed with improving. So, we wanted replays so we could find what our mistakes are. But like we even added um the ability to look at replays while you're queuing up for your next game. And so this is like um like you get into this routine where you finish a game and you go okay queue up for your next game and then click replay and then look at the replay and you can spend a few seconds looking at the replay while you're waiting for your next match and now I do this every time and it's just a great way to sort of summarize what just happened and figure out what you could have done better that is how you get better I need to do that and I'm going to do that from now on thank you I, I mean, like games like StarCraft have had that too, but I, I think they found that most players never ever watch their replays. I don't do it enough with uh, League of Legends, for example, when I know I should. Yeah, well, League of Legends doesn't even have its own replay system. It doesn't. No, it's I a third-party one. Yeah, actually, low replay is terrible. But yeah, I have to record it with streaming software and then watch it later. So it's, it's such a bother that it, that it's built into Prismata itself is just fantastic. See, I just, I don't think it's that hard to make a replay system. Literally all you do is record every action in the game and play yeah. them back. Like, if you could play the game, then you should be able to play the replay. I don't see why it's so hard. Like, we, we made replays in a couple of days. It wasn't hard, and I don't think it would be any harder for a game like League. I don't know. I think they have, they've, they've, when the little bits they've talked about, they said some things in regards to, well, the person I was watching just lost, um, in regards to, that it's such a big and complicated uh, coding system and that it did it so poorly to begin with back when the game was new so that they can't do it now. But to be honest, it seems a little bit like an excuse. Well, it, it does, but in all honesty, if, if, it, if it wasn't poorly coded, if it was coded well, then replays should be really easy. That's, at least that's my intuition as a software developer. Yeah. Um, if, if they say it's a pain in the ass, then it, it must be because it wasn't coded well. That's, yeah. that's sort of the conclusion that you have to draw from it. So basically, I believe them because enough people want replays that if it was easy, they would have done it by now. And they're a huge company, right? So. Absolutely. Huge. I mean, there's probably a whole team of development behind it doing it for like the past three years and still not able to do it. Uh, I'm not sure if I believe that. I don't know. Maybe. Well, this has been fantastic. Thanks so much for agreeing to do this, by the way. Oh, well, know. thank you. Um, I, I look forward to seeing it. Yeah, I'll be, uh, if it's okay, I'll be posting the video on YouTube, and I'll be doing uh, an article for the interview itself. I'll Absolutely, that sounds wonderful. Yeah, and I'll, um, I'll email it to you, because I have your email address, because you sent me a code. I will Great. Uh, email both to you. And I realize now that I should have streamed this. That probably would have been a really good idea.
You could have. <laughs> oh well. Hindsight's twenty twenty. All right. Thanks so much. You've been really great. I didn't realize we did that. We do. We were doing this for so long, but it uh, just kind of flowed. <laughs> All right. No, I when you get me talking about this game, I don't shut up. I know that happens. Well, it's just nice to talk to someone about it who knows so much about it, and obviously you do. And it's just to get all this information from it. It's just excellent. Because I've really, I've the only person I play this with is my girlfriend. I know very little information about it other than what I that and what I read on Reddit. So it's nice to talk to someone who's so deep into it. <laughs> all right. So uh, yeah, I'll end it here. Thanks very much. All right. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.